I'm Anthony Kovic with LeaderCast, and today I have Rodimus Para from France. Rodimus, Rodimus is an actor who's been in many roles over the over the decades, and also has run several businesses. So, Rodimus, thank you for being on LeaderCast. You're welcome. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Now, you, you know, you've worked on quite a few, you know, TV shows and movies. You know, one of my favorite movies is, um, you know, Red Dawn with Patrick Swayze. Can you give us a little bit about how did you end up um, uh, working with Patrick Swayze? Right. Well, um, I think a part of it had to do with the fact that I have, uh, I'm have i bilingual, or before I became trilingual, I was bilingual, and that was uh, I spoke Russian. I speak, it was my first language before English, actually. Even though I was born in the U.S., my mom uh, is Russian, and I grew up around her family. So um, I, I had that in my, in my, on my resume, and uh, when John Milius was casting uh, Red Dawn, he needed the part of this uh, Russian soldier who tracks the kids up into the forest. Uh, and he's a radar tracker and has, has scenes earlier in the film, one of which unfortunately was cut out that established my character. Uh, the other one is a, a, a scene with uh, Jennifer Grey where I'm actually flirting with her just after she's planted a bomb in the middle of town. But because I was dressed in my, uh, my formal uh, officer wear, uh, when I appear later in the film, uh, after the Wolverines have ambushed me and I'm in my snow outfit, people did not make, make the association with the earlier scene because it looks so very different in different contexts. Had the first scene been in, been in the film, it would have made a much easier tie-in. But in any event, um, Milius was kind enough to let me write some of my own dialogue in Russian. So that was kind of fun. Um, uh, and of course, it was great working with Patrick Swayze and, and Charlie Sheen and Oh gosh, you know, Jennifer Grey and C. Thomas Howell and who else? Gosh, there's a, several, several great actors in that film. And, uh, oh, oh, Powers Booth. My God. I didn't work directly with Powers, but of course I did work with, with Swayze and what a wonderful man. Uh, great actor, really, really neat person. It was a pleasure. It was a great experience. Now, you've been an actor for, when did you actually start acting? Around what age? What, what age? Right. So, um, I was cast, uh, in, uh, the film A Dream of Kings when I was just, I was cast just before I was eight years old. I started shooting. I was, I had turned eight years old. Um, and it was to play Anthony Quinn's dying son in a feature film. Uh, the boy has a rheumatic heart and, uh, the title of the film A Dream of Kings is the, is the dream that Quinn's character, who is the father, he's a Greek, he's a Greek father, uh, living on the south side of Chicago in the late sixties. And he's got three kids and his son, his one and only son, who's his youngest, is dying. And he has, and he's a hustler, you know, he's trying to make ends meet. The grandmother, you know, the mother-in-law lives in the apartment with him. Irene Pappas, played my mother, really wonderful uh, Greek actress, international star at the time. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, so the dream is that he can raise enough money to get him and this, and the boy onto an airplane and go to Greece where he believes that the Son that's shown on his ancestors will heal the boy's heart. And that's the end of the film. We're on the airplane. So that's, that's the story. Now, you know, you've also played a role on the little house on the prairie as well. All right. So how did you end up on the, that specific role? Right. Okay. So I had just come off of Kung Fu. Um, it had been just maybe a year since the end of Kung Fu, uh, which I did till I was about 14 and a half years old. And then when I was 15, I uh, was considered to be, I had already done quite a bit of work in Hollywood as a character actor. I'd done, you know, a lot of different kinds of character roles. The kid next door. I was, you know, Shaolin monk. <laughs> uh, I played a lot of different ethnicities. Uh, and um, this was actually a real all-American role, but he was a sensitive kid. He was a poet and a writer, John Jr. So um, I was able to get in to see Michael Landon straight away rather than going through a process of, you know, reading for other people first uh, because I had, you know, the chops and some a track record in Hollywood at that point. Uh, I was able to come in directly and read for Michael and it, it went well. And so I ended up uh, playing that really wonderful role that uh, was a really great experience to work with, uh, with Michael and the other people in the, involved in that show, who, some of whom I'm still friends with to this day. Well, wow, that is awesome. Now, when it comes to being an actor, is that something you you really prepared and dreamed to be an actor, or is that something you just swerved into into the business? Great question. Um, 
my mother was an actress and uh, she had never thought of putting me in the business. But when she was actually up for a part in that same first film that I did uh, with Anthony Quinn, uh, she was actually up for uh, a lead in that film. So she invited the director over for a dinner party with some friends. And she told me to stay upstairs and eat my beef stroganoff in my room because she didn't want the director to know that she had a seven and a half year old son because it would have made her a little bit older than the part that she was up for. But I found a reason to come downstairs and uh, I got introduced and my mother was like, ah, <laughs> but the director said, you know, uh, that I looked a lot like what he imagined. This was um, uh, Daniel Mann, the director, Daniel Mann, wonderful, a classic film director, did some really great films for Love of Ivy, um, uh, Come Back a Little Sheba. Uh, so he was directing this film and um, he said, you know, to my mom, he said, you know, have you ever thought of putting him in, in the business? And she said, no, not really. He said, well, he has this quality that I really think might work. Can, can you bring him down to the studio next week and see if he can take direction and we'll just go from there? And she was like, okay. And so um, I came down there and I remember very well the, the whole interview and, and how that went. It was a, it was like a pretend experiment and I had fun with it. And then I did a screen test and a makeup test and ended up working for 11 weeks um, as Quinn's son. So you didn't you didn't prepare? Did did you have let's say a, a um, an agent after that? Did you build up your credibility and develop an agent? And well, right, so, right. And more to your point, then uh, I didn't really have a desire for it myself. But um, once this happened, uh, I did get an agent, uh, or it was actually I think a friend of my mom's, or, or actually maybe her agent at the time, possibly. In any event, he did very well by me, and uh, and he ended up. I ended up getting me a whole string of roles that just continued uh, throughout my throughout my teens. Um, I mean, from the time I was eight years old, I was working pretty regularly. I went to regular school because, you know, unless you're on a series where you're working every day on the show, you go back to regular public school, which is where I went, not, pub, not private school, but most of the time. And, uh, and then when you're on the set, you're in school. But, yeah, I, you know, it was fun. Uh, I liked being around adults. I was an only child, so I was always around my mom's friends when I was young. And um, this was just a continuation of being around adults. And, you know, I was precocious, I guess, in some ways. And um, so it was it was enjoyable. I did, had no idea what it meant to have a career, you know, and the responsibilities of all that, which settled in on me uh, once I reached my uh, my late teens. And, and then I went to study acting in New York to, to get better at it and then come back to L.A. and found uh, that... It's uh, it's a tough it's a tough road to hoe uh, to have your own career in Hollywood. And uh, since I didn't have my heart was never really fully engaged as an actor. I really wanted to be a director at a certain point when I was about 13 years old. So I stayed in the business for as long as I did, hoping to be able to parlay an acting career into a directorial career, which I took very seriously. Um, but that didn't pan out exactly how I had hoped. Um, and I didn't have the emotional or intestinal fortitude to do what so many people have to do to make it in that business, which is have a cast iron stomach and have a giant ego that's in a good place. If you can keep it there to be able to keep moving forward in that direction. I just kind of like at a certain point was like, I had this, you know, I didn't like when the phone rang, I was like, run to catch, you know, answer the phone. Maybe it's my agent with an interview or something. That whole thing really bothered me about myself. So I, I really had to take some distance and do something else with my life. And so in my late twenties, I started my own business and that was a really smart decision. It was very good for me to do that. And we'll, we'll get to that part. Now you're on the platform, coach the world. And just like for those who are watching right now, this is how the platform actually interacts. You're actually talking one-on-one -on -one, just like any, you know, um, whether it's um, any conference call formula, it's built into the system, so you're able to communicate with the person who you're part of the coach the world once they sign up and 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 purchase a service on coach the world. You're able to actually communicate with them via this platform, just like we're doing right now. Why did you sign up and become a coach the world coach? What values are you putting out there in this platform that people really need? Great question. Uh, I have no idea. No, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. No, just kidding. Um, sorry, I couldn't couldn't pass up the opportunity to, to bring some humor into it. Um, listen, I uh, I always like talking with people. I'm not really great at small talk. I never have been in my life. I mean, I can do it, but I don't prefer it. I prefer to talk about real things with people. 
So um, I have, I think, some valuable life experience. Uh, I've, I've uh, surmounted several personal hurdles in my in my life, uh, overcame some obstacles from some impediments that existed in my life from an early childhood, and um, uh, hard work that I did uh, myself and and uh, and in life. I hope to be able to share some of that with people. Um, even if it's just as simple as a form of you know, genuine encouragement to fielding uh, difficult questions about, you know, uh, if people are seeking advice or just want to run something by another person who will give them honest feedback and, and not coddle them, you know, as a friend might or a family member, but someone who really, you know, uh, will give my straight opinion about something if they're honest with me and they're ready to hear it. You know, I also am sensitive to people. I don't, I don't try to trample on, on anybody's, uh, sensitivity or anything like that. But, but if, if people are open, um, I'm willing to share my best guess and insight into what has worked for me in my life. Uh, it may, it may or may not be useful to you, but, uh, I think it is. I think that we have so many, uh, we have much more in common than we have not in common with one another. And, and if I can reach down into a deeper part of my experience, and if that can be of some help to other people, well, that's why I'm here. Well, I mean, you have done a lot of roles, in, especially in the Hollywood career, whether you're the grasshopper in Kung Fu working, you know, alongside David Carradine, Patrick Swayze, um, Charlie Sheen. These are all experiences that many people in the world who may want to be part of the Hollywood or acting career, the insight that you have in these areas is incredibly valuable. I mean, I, I have quite a few questions, but we're not going to be able to cover everything. So is that part of the conversation? If someone wants insight into the Hollywood lifestyle, how to get in, how to talk to, you know, an agent, how to get an agent, are, are these part of the conversations? Anything anybody wants to bring up. I mean, I, nothing is, um, nothing is off the table. So, uh, but again, I can only offer my experience and the experience that I know other people have had who are friends or other people who I've grown up with in the business or what have you. Um, I can offer perspective based on, you know, my experience. And of course, there's, there's no one way in, you know, uh, and I'll be honest with people about that. But the thing is, because there is no one way in, there is obviously many, many ways in. I mean, for example, um, Sly Stallone, you know, how he, uh, how he got to do Rocky, you know, he, they wanted to buy his script and have somebody else star in it. And he said, no, if you like my story, if you want to buy my story, then you got to make me the star of it. So he just stuck to his guns, you know, and that's how he got uh, his foot firmly in the door. Uh, so, you know, that's one way. But there's many, many ways. And uh, I've tried a few of them. And I also realized that for me personally, at a certain point, I had to take a step away. Uh, but now as a much older person, I just turned 60. Um, I will be, uh, I'm, I'm looking to get back into it again from a completely different perspective. Um, I have the acting skills, so, uh, I'd like to use them for the benefit of my family. That's really the bottom line for me is my daughter. I, I became a father four years ago for the first time in my life. So, uh, I have that to be considerate of now. And, uh, and she is a, you know, important person to me. So I'd like to make her proud and, uh, I would like to, uh, See if I can pull out some what's the, whatever's left of the cachet I've got in, in Hollywood or elsewhere or just in my skill set. See if I can make that work again. But that's just you know I'm not putting all the eggs in that basket, mind you. It's just a it's just a, something that I'm exploring at this point. Now, are you are you are you still working in France? You are in France. Um, are you still working in in France doing business or anything, or are you completely retired? No, no. I, I retired from the business that I started in 1988 uh, and ran for 27 years uh, and started. It was actually a, um, a word of mouth based business, usually a regional business, meaning that this kind of a business people don't usually move. But I moved uh, at least four times in the 27 years and had to start the thing up again from almost from scratch, except for the backlog of clients that I had, some of whom were pretty high profile. So that helped me when I restarted in other cities. Um, but I've had that challenge several times in my life, and it's been really satisfying to successfully uh, restart a business that does require 
word of mouth because I, I didn't really spend much money on advertising and or I never made a cent back from my advertising, I should say. Um, it was all based on recommendations. And so that was something that uh, I was proud of. It compensated for all the years that I spent waiting for the phone to ring as, a, as an actor and waiting for my agent to get me a, con- you know, a, a connection or an interview with somebody. And then the casting person to decide to want to hire me. And then the director, all these people stood between me and my gainful employment and my self esteem about what I was worth, you know, doing, uh, starting my own business, building it with my two hands was something that really was a revelation to me. And it was incredibly important, uh, for my restoring, uh, regaining uh, a sense of self and a sense of self-worth, uh, honestly, uh, because I had suffered a bit in the, in the lean years of my latter years of my first act, uh, of my acting. Um, so, so, uh, let's see, how can I wrap this all up here? Um, <laughs> I almost lost the train of thought there. Uh, generally speaking though, um, I would say that, um, I'm happy that I have gotten somewhere in life and I really feel like it's important to challenge yourself and to not be afraid of making changes when you feel, when you feel inside that there's something other that you need to do. If you respond to that, usually you'll find out pretty quickly if it's the right thing or not. And with me, when I did this other business in 1988, I immediately had affirmation that I was doing, that I was on the right track. And so, and it gave me a lot it's just to be able to work with my hands and my brain and then come home at the end of the day with a check. Whew, that was amazing for me. Well, and compared to, so the life of an actor, once a role is done, you're basically now waiting for people to see whether they talk to your agent, how, you know, how often your agent put, puts your name out into the next program or the next movie, the next show, the next commercial. And there's a process that takes place, I'm assuming, where, right. you know, a call comes in. So in between your last role and the new call, it could be months, years, decades. How, how does that, so what's it like? As you were saying, you, you turn to building another business while this was going on. So you were doing that business and the affirmations took place more readily compared to waiting for the acting roles to come together. Is that what right. I'm getting? Yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly. To be able to uh, manifest um, uh, livelihood uh, directly rather than having all these uh, middle persons involved, which is what acting is. Unless you're a star and you've got people, you know, dropping scripts off at your house all the time, or you've got people reading scripts for you and suggesting ones that you tell them, you would like to have it to have a certain quality, unless you're in that position where you have choices as to what you do. Most actors are just hoping for that next phone call, you know, from their agent. So um, that's the majority of, of the experience of being an actor in Hollywood. Uh, you asked me earlier, and this is where I lost the train of thought. You were asking me, um, you know, uh, are you working now? What are you doing now? Have you completely retired? Um, I'm a full time dad. Uh, I take care of my daughter uh, right now. She's in school she, and I have to pick her up in a little while. Uh, and then she'll, then it'll just be all about her. And I have just a few hours a day, uh, for free time. Uh, and what I do is I write, I'm writing my autobiography, uh, which I'm almost done with and I'm looking for a publisher. Um, and I am also writing for, um, uh, there's a company in France here that does tour, tours, tourism, uh, throughout different regions of France. And I've uh, become friends with the owner of that company. Um, uh, actually worked for him as a tour guide uh, not too long ago. Uh, before COVID. And once COVID happened, the tourism business is, of course, just fell away, just dropped like a lead balloon. Um, but uh, he's anticipating, you know, the virus going away, which it will soon. Um, and he's preparing for the next, his next act with, with his business. And he's having me rewrite all of the things that he's a Frenchman. So his English is not fantastic. It's pretty good, but he writes things. And then I realized that they they look a little quaint, you know, when you read them. So he realizes the value of having someone who has a command of the English language because he's reaching out to English speaking uh, clientele in, in uh, America and in England and in Australia who all come to France because, you know, 50 million people visit Paris, you know, every year. So, um, so yeah, so I've been hired to do that. And that's, that's my, that's my new day job. And I love writing. I get to do it at home and, uh, and then I get to take care of my daughter at the same time. So it's, it's working out. Um, there are other things I want to do in my life, but that's really good for me right now. 
Yeah, I mean, um, you know, our little one is in, you know, homeschooling and because, um, well, virtual schooling and because of COVID. And it's been tremendously awesome because I get to see her all day long throughout the day. I drop into her, you know, into her room, which I have it set up for her class. And, but also the whole house is also part of, you know, the, the classroom. Because when she does dance class, she has to use the living room. So she, she pulls out her laptop, brings it out into the living room, does her thing. I'm in the dining room now instead of my office. And we're constantly shifting. Sometimes my wife will be doing her webinars in, you know, in, in, in the other room. And, and we're always doing these things. And it's, it's so much exciting to be at home. I think the dynamics, and maybe you have some insight on this, of COVID making this kind of face-to-face um, connections with people that they can't see physically, you know, sometimes ever. What do you think of that? Oh, well, that really points to a larger uh, development in our, in our, in our lives uh, with just the technology in general. I mean, COVID has sort of put a magnifying lens over, the usefulness of this technology that we have had around now for a little while. Of course, it's gotten even better in the last, you know, year since, since COVID has been around. Um, you know, with Zoom, everybody doing Zoom things and stuff like that. And of course, this coach the world, which is, which is really very well designed, uh, bit of software, I would say. Um, but yes, uh, the, the intimacy that allows a person to sit in their home as you are and me in my home, we're both in our comfortable environment able to have a conversation. We were strangers before a few minutes ago, and yet here we are talking about some of the most uh, personal and real things that we can. So um, that's a that's a magical thing in a way, you know, brought about. I say magical in quotes, brought about by the te- technology that works well enough that you can be in the U.S. and I can be in Europe, and it's like we're having we're, we're sitting across the table from one another. I think that's pretty amazing. The implications of that, you know, I think back on Marshall McLuhan who said, you know, the medium is the message, right? when he was talking about television, the early days of television. Well, this is a whole other leap forward in terms of being able to reach out to people across the planet and have these kinds of conversations. So I think that in the long term, uh, I hope I'm an optimist. I'm a bit of a, a idealist. Uh, I hope that it brings us closer together. Um, the divisions that we've recently seen both in the U S and also in Europe um, have cast some, you know, shadows on what may be the dark side of technology and that it allows people to sort of compartmentalize themselves into their own set of beliefs. So that's the dark side. But the bright side is breaking through those with these kinds of conversations and learning about other cultures and other people in different parts of the world. I hope that that's something that people will use this technology for as well to get to know each other more and uh, realize, as I said earlier, that we have much more in common than we, than we don't. Well, I, I believe it, it's definitely going in that re- direction where more and more people, you know, I'm part of a PodFest Multimedia Expo where we have a podcasting conference um, for the last, we're going into the seventh year and it's always in Orlando in Florida because everybody wants to come to Florida. So we might as well have it in Florida and we have people, last year we had people from over 25 countries participating, flying into Florida. It was the weekend right before COVID became COVID. Before that, it was just discussion, talk. And March 5th through the 8th, we were at the World Marriott, PodFest Multimedia Expo. For those that, you know, that is the website address. And what happened is, out of the 2,000 people, 1,500 did show up, but it was the last day, March 8th, every hotel room in Orlando basically closed. Every conference closed, was canceled. We were the last, if we would have been one weekend later, we would have been canceled. And you know what it's like refunding, you know, 2,000 people for, no. with the average of 300 to $1,500 a ticket. It's oh my gosh! Not fun. Oh. oh boy! Oh boy! Yeah. It's definitely not well, fun. Well, congratulations. But... So I mean, that's great that that actually took place then. Before, yes. yeah. 
it, it is, but more and more people are accessing these platforms through what is called the podcast. This is basically a very similar platform. Um, people talking, recording, using this content into a, a piece that people can, you know, learn from, purchase from, do stuff. The access to the technology has spun off so many, so many ideas that there is room for so much more. And, you know, but let's, let's get into you. You touched on something a little bit earlier on, you know, you're doing some kind of, um, you're going to, you're writing your memoirs and something else regarding your memoirs. You're oh, well, I'm, I'm writing, I'm actually rewriting uh, a, a website, uh, all the content, all the English content of a rather elaborate uh, tourism website. Um, for, for someone else. I'm working for someone else who's it's their, it's their baby. It's their business, but I'm, I'm helping them, uh, communicate better with their English speaking, uh, potential audience and customer base. No, I, so, I thought I, I thought I heard, or maybe I've read it that you're writing a book as well. Well, I said my autobiography. Yes. Oh, okay. So that's the, the book. Okay. So, so yes, yes. Your autobiography. Is that is that is that something you're writing for the purpose of teaching people about you, or you're trying to create a purpose of why they should do what? What is the purpose of the autobiography? Okay, well, that's that's a really excellent, excellent, straightforward question. Um, as with anything like that, I, I imagine other people in the same position as myself would probably tell you that it's multifaceted. When I began, I just really wanted to tell my story. Um, as I was writing it, uh, my daughter came into being, and I realized that uh, that this would be something for her uh, because you know there's a possibility uh, since I'm I'm 60 years old and she's four that you know uh, I may not be able to have a conversation with her when she's 30. You know, uh, if I live to be 90, yes, but you know, or 80 sec 86, but you know, most people check out sometime around then anyway. And, and by that time, you know, I would like to be able to have something for her to read about her dad and her dad's life and her dad's parents' life um, that she would not otherwise have a chance to really know uh, at that age. So maybe when she's in her thirties and forties, she'll really have some questions about, you know, who was her dad and what, you know, what was his background like? And so, so now it, it's uh, the writing is um, imbued with even more, um, intent to communicate uh, the truth of my existence to my daughter. So, of course, the book will be dedicated to her uh, as well. Um, and the th and third, you know, um, I am writing. I'm tr the the angle that I'm approaching this with is um, ki I don't know if it's unique, but it's unique to me. I haven't I haven't read another book that did this exactly. An another memoir. Um, I'm telling a story that's spanning two generations, maybe two and a half generations. Um, my mother was uh, Russian uh, and she was born, literally born into World War II. And not long after her birth, uh, her parents and her and her older brother were, were captured by the Germans. They were Russian and they were captured by Germans, but because they weren't Jewish, they weren't executed. They were put into hard labor. But my mom was a baby and she was left alone. So in the camp, you know, while her parents were gone all day, pounding rocks, you know. So um, they survived. Uh, they escaped the uh, occupation, uh, Polish occupation in Germany, and escaped into the American sector uh, when the war was over. And they lived for three years in the American sector in Bavaria before they were then brought to the United States by uh, Leo Tolstoy's daughter, who was lobbying uh, Harry Truman, to please bring these, some of these Russian refugees, these displaced persons, bring them to the States and give them, give them an apartment, give them a job, which was what he eventually did. So when she was eight years old, she came to America and, uh, with a lot of trauma, untreated PTSD, um, and other traumas that happened to her and, um, began her life in, in America and discovered. And when she was around, you know, 11, 12 discovered acting and then went to the high school of performing arts in New York. And then went on to stage and then screen. She came to Hollywood in 1963 to pursue an acting career and did pretty well. So, um, 
but she never dealt with her, the traumas and how that influenced her life as well as her parenting skills and how when I was then put into similar situations uh, that she was in uh, as an actor and other things, uh, how what, what the shortcomings were for her as to how to help me understand what was happening to me. Part of that inability of hers was due to her never having dealt with some of these things that happened to her and left me kind of wondering why I never got the kind of guidance that I could have had had she maybe figured out some of these things that were happening had happened to her. So, so sort of like, you know, uh, it's generation, how things are passed down. And that's kind of what I'm hoping to cover in the book, because so many things that people have in their lives, um, they tend to sometimes take full responsibility for it themselves instead of realizing that some of these things were, were inherited literally genetically as well as psychologically and emotionally. So having been someone who spent most of my life uh, in a personal improvement modality, uh, that being the priority of my life is to be a, a healthy person um, and do the work. Um, I think that that's an interesting angle to take because it really helps people realize, parse out. I'm hoping that my book will help people parse out what is something that they can take responsibility for and what they basically don't have to blame themselves for. And I think when you can start parsing that, piecing that out in your life, it makes things more manageable and allows uh, a, a different approach to personal growth um, and more resonance with other people who've maybe been going through the same thing. So I'm hoping to find that kind of resonance in my readership. Well, I think, you know, like sometimes, and, and, and I have, you know, we all have the box of stuff in their lives, so to speak. And sometimes when you try to ex try to figure out and explain every part, you don't find, you don't push forward, you know, because maybe you you know, your mom decided to put that on the side and focus on her life and build a life, build a family. You know, the things that, you know, the coddling that maybe you have missed or we all miss that because our parents just like as my daughter gets older, I've always thought that I would be doing a lot more, but you still are running your life and the, and, and, and the things that you have to get done and they're building right. their life and the things they have to get done. They have school, they have activities, they have friends. Right. You have your life, you have work, you have to, you know, you have to, you know, pay the mortgage. So we all have those things that have to get done. And the more we kind of dwell on it in, in, in some respects is that what you could have done, this, even if you had all the time in the world, you know, as you will, as you will learn, your daughter, once your daughter has friends, it's their friends more, are more important than you. <laughs> right, right. Well, and I, I hear what you're saying. I'm actually, maybe I should make uh, my point a little more clearly. My mother was ill-equipped to be a parent. Uh, and she was ill-equipped to even deal with some of the most basic, uh, emotional challenges. Um, and so she was a depressive. She was an alcoholic. Uh, she was an overeater and she was a compulsive hoarder. So by the time she had lived in the home that I grew up in, for 40, which by the time she had lived in that home for 43 years, she literally had pushed herself out of an 11 room house oh, and was wow. living in a, she was living in a, in a motel room in, in, in North Hollywood. Uh, and, and finally called me up on the phone and said, I think I need your help. And I'm like, okay, what's going on? And I went and saw her and I realized, oh my gosh, this is pretty bad, you know, cause there was no room for her anymore in the house. So. Uh, that's the extreme I'm talking about. I'm not talking about uh, yeah, just that is a little extreme where you have you've collect. Listen, I see it. Every, I'm I'm in Florida, in the Tampa Bay Gulf Coast area, of Florida, and every day, I, every time I see, everyone has garages down here, but their cars are outside. You know why? Because their yeah. their garages are full of junk. Stuff that's worth nothing. They'll leave their thirty, forty thousand dollar car outside in the elements, right. and leave a few thousand dollars worth of trash that ain't worth 
a few thousand dollars anymore anyway and still leave that in the garage, which yeah. I would never do. If it, anything that can't, if my car can't fit in the garage from any item, that item goes in the trash. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's that is the healthy approach. Yes, I agree. I've always made it a point to be able to park one car and one motorcycle in every garage I've ever owned or lived, in, you know, in or rented because uh yeah, because of the example that my mom set, you know, it's like I never ever want to keep something, you know, past its its usefulness and um yes, I think people have that issue, you know. And and there's a reason for that. You know, that's the thing is that Hoarding is a is an emotional issue. Uh, it's it's a fear, among other things. It's many things, but one of them is it's a fear of not having something when you need it. So I'll put it aside. It's a fear of well, I spend money on that, so why should I give it away to Goodwill? You know, it costs money. It has value, but if you're not using it, of course, it has no value except in your head. You know, and so many people, as you say, you know, have garages if they're lucky. Or houses, if they're, you know, if it's if it's if it's infiltrated into the home from the garage, then they have a problem, you know. And uh, these are emotional issues. These are mental health issues uh, that uh, I think there's huge mental health issues yet in our culture that have to be addressed. I mean, I mean, uh, forgive me for getting, uh, hitting a political hot button here, but you know, gun collection, uh, you know, large large collections of guns can sometimes be a sign of some sort of insecurity or, I mean, unless you're like, you know, become an aficionado collector and you have, you know, that's just one of your hobbies. I'm talking about just people who just buy too many guns because they're afraid that there's going to be something going to happen that they need to have an arsenal for. You know, that's a mental health issue to me. If Sorry, you know, I, I don't mean to offend anybody watching this, but, you know, I mean, if you grew up in a family of guns and responsible, you know, gun ownership and hunting and things, that's another story. I'm talking about people who just buy too many guns because they have an addiction to solving a personal insecurity with the purchase of a firearm. That's what I'm talking about. So it has, things like I mean, that. Listen, those things are everywhere. Problems are everywhere. And, you know, the gun issue in, you know, all over the world is not necessarily a hoarding issue. It could be. You know, people like to collect, and not, I know quite a few collectors. I'm not one of them, but you know, there are people who will spend thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of dollars on these collectible weapons. Right. They're very. It's a very expensive hobby. So it is. there are those who do that because they're collectors, just like those who collect baseball cards for something that costed a penny, and they'll spend a thousand dollars, two thousand dollars, which. You know, it's this, this, it's the same addiction. It is a process of just like your mother's, you know, we need to get off this subject because there's lots <laughs> of great stuff. We're going to look, I'm looking forward to, you know, do you have a projected idea of when this autobiography may be available or at least projected? Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I can't give a time projection. I can only give you a process projection. Uh, once I either find a good literary agent and or a publisher uh, who would like to publish the book for me, uh, I wouldn't be able to give you a timeline. It's 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 not complete, but it's it's getting pretty close. Certainly close enough for uh, one of those folks to to be able to take it on to represent it or to or to print it. So um, or to give me a deadline to finish it, whatever kind of thing. So. I'm I'm looking for that at the moment. Um, how many pages? So roughly no, I, are, how, how how deep are you in? How many pages roughly? Oh boy! You know I haven't done a page count recently. I've got chapters. I've got um, eight chapters of what is probably a twelve chapter book. You know, um, my my guess. And again, I my it's my first time out. I love writing. I've written all my life. I've enjoyed writing, but I've never written a book before. So my objectivity is a little. And not quite where it might be had I, if, if this were my second book, you know, uh, or third one. Um, but, uh, I need, I need someone to look at it, tell me what it needs, what it, what needs to go away. I need that kind of feedback at this point too. So, um, I've lost my objectivity somewhat. Um, and I think every writer, uh, depends on the kindness and expertise of others to help them make it better. I just certainly know that 
uh, people like Allison Arngram, my colleague from Little House on the Prairie, you know, she had lots of help. Uh, Mary McDonough, who from the Waltons, who wrote a wonderful uh, biography memoir, you know, she had a tremendous amount of help too. And she thanks everybody who made it better, you know, so I need the same thing now. Now, you know, you, you worked on the Kung Fu movie with David Carradine, you know, and was he a actual Kung Fu artist or was it just acting? Right. Well, you know, people assume that I worked with him. I worked near him, but never with him because we played the same character, of course. Uh, so we were never on the screen at the same time. Um, but we were around each other enough that I got to know him. Um, and the answer to your question is he had some dance training and he was first and foremost uh, an actor and a good one. Um, and when they used slow motion, Some of the moves that the technical advisor taught him just before they went on to shoot it or the day before or the week before or whenever, he had some training to, you know, understand how the movement worked, but he approached it from the standpoint of a, of a dance person who's had some dance training. So it wasn't until later in his life that he started to take the Kung Fu seriously. And I think he actually ended up doing a little bit more Tai Chi perhaps than Kung Fu. Um, and, uh, He certainly parlayed uh, the perception that he was into Kung Fu to his advantage over the years. Um, but I don't believe that he was ever uh, devoted to it like most people who, you know, call themselves martial art, uh, artists or martial arts practitioners or, or what have you would have done. I, I think just like me, too, he was more into the philosophy of it. Um, I was steeped in in Eastern thought uh, for a number of years before I even started, you know, got the role. And I think David also was into uh, some of the mysticism of the East and uh, that helped us both uh, approach the role with some insight into where this line of thinking is going and allowed us to portray the part in, 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 a, in, a, in a way that worked. I mean, his work in the show, the way he embodies that role of the humble, you know, priest wandering the West is just, he did a superb job with that, you know, and, and me as a, as the young student, you know, I, I think I was full of questions and uh, wonderment and confusion. And uh, as any young person would be, who would be in a, in a situation like that in a, in a Buddhist monastery, uh, Shaolin monastery. So we brought our own personal background as best we could into, into the role. And I, and it obviously worked. And the people who, cast us knew what they were doing apparently well it's always interesting when you have really good specialists in 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 a in, in a artist meaning kung fu art or you know the, the the discipline of it who play it on a on a tv screen or a movie screen and you're always wondering are these people actually the artists or is it just you know tv effects and basic training and and and, and staging by the director to make them look as professional as they are In the case of Kung Fu, it would be the latter. Now, you, you've also played um, a role in the movie, you know, in the TV show Lassie. How, how, how did that come about? Well, um, just the normal process of uh, being, you know, agent calling and saying, you have a reading for this role today and uh, or tomorrow afternoon, whatever. Show up at 3.30 and read, you know, read the, read the scene that they give you and in front of the casting person and or the director and you either get the part or you don't, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's a, it's a numbers game at that point. So, um, I, I had, you know, I had a reputation at that point in my life, uh, of being able to deliver the emotional goods. I was a kid who could cry, uh, not on cue, like boom, cry, but, but could deliver, could deliver the emotional realism that's necessary. Uh, so I ended up playing, Uh, you know, deaf, not, not deaf mute, but mute, uh, traumatized mute on an episode of Canon. I ended up playing a, a boy uh, who is, uh, hears about his diagnosis as having brain tumor and flips out on Hawaii 5 -0. Um, in fact, the last year role was one of the more regular sort of normal roles that I had. I was a runaway, uh, and then kind of got taken into the, the, the Lassie family fold. But other things I did, you know, uh, Handicapped, you know, leg braces, uh, polio, uh, scarlet fever, um, plague victim, uh, little, uh, uh, night gallery. I was 
We don't know what happened to that boy in Silent Snow, Secret Snow. Was he autistic? Was he deranged? Was he possessed? So these were, these were the questions that were ambiguously unanswered by Orson Welles' narration in, 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 uh, in Night Gallery. So, yeah, so I had a reputation as being able to, you know, to, I was a real actor, you know, a real character actor, which is an unusual thing for a kid to find themselves doing. <laughs> Now, when it comes to, so what do you do on your free time? Like, you know, you. Free time? What are you talking about free time? Yeah, there, Who's got free there, time when you're a parent? <laughs> well, you're perceived free time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, yeah, so I have, uh, I have interest. I, I love motorcycle riding. I'm, I'm a big motorcycle touring enthusiast. Um, not dirt bikes as much. I used to do dirt bikes when I was a teenager, but uh, I like road touring, exploring. Uh, back roads, which there are many of around in France. Um, uh, I've traveled across parts of the United States when, for years on motor motorcycles, um, so I enjoy that. Um, and I have a huge gun collection. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was, I knew that was coming. I knew it was there. <laughs> no, no, actually, um, I uh, I was You're raised anti gun. I did. What, what's that? You're hoarding guns instead of yeah, other right. stuff, right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> no, I'm not. I am not. Um, but uh, so, um, what else do I like? Well, to be honest with you, uh, I uh, I actually am considering buying a drone, camera drone, and uh, uh, because I there's so many beautiful things uh, in the countryside where I live um, that are worth worth taking in from the vantage point of that a drone can give you. And I'm 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 in the market for a drone at the moment, so yeah. Uh, a dr I have a drone. I have a. I have one that's. It's. It's useful for indoors, and it can go outside. It's. It's also designed for outside, but, you know, depending on the kind of drone you get, depends on the ability to do certain things. Where the right. bigger the drone, you got to carry it. It's a box. So the smaller right. is the one I have. It's called a camera drone, and it just opens up, and it's. Right. It's caged in so the fans are locked in. So even if they touch anything. It doesn't right. damage anything, or you can't really get hurt from it if it hit someone. So indoors, right. it's designed to capture, you know, those really nice tall ceiling shots of the space, and it, uh -huh. it really great. It really works great with real estate and the ability to capture those really nice shots. Where the sure. bigger the bigger drones with the big propellers, they have a tendency if if they go wild, you know, everybody run for you know run for cover. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I'm thinking of getting a small one too, but at least it has, you know, uh, was it uh, 2.7K uh, resolution? Uh, that's kind of where I'm, what I'm looking at at this point. At this point, because I do. I mean, look, uh, you know, I'll be honest with you. You know, moving to France wasn't the most practical thing uh, for career-wise because I didn't speak a word of French when I moved here. Uh, I married a French woman in America, and then we had our baby in the U.S., and then became very apparent that uh, that she needed to be near her parents. And I also realized that I wasn't going to be able to provide grandparents for my daughter in the U.S. because they both passed away, um, and that I wanted my daughter to have the same experience or some similar experience that I had as a kid because my parents were very figured very prominently in my young childhood. So I wanted her to have that. And the only really the only way to make that happen would be to move here. So that was the overriding motivation to move here. But then I had to figure out how to make it work. So buying a drone actually is not only going to fulfill some of my own filmmaking aspirations that I want to do for myself, just, just expressing myself. But also I realized that there's a, a an angle. Um, I, I, part of my family is in real estate too. And I would like to be able to offer them that service to help them with their, with their uh, properties that they have. So, um, so that's something that I'm going to, Trying to also monetize it in some way as well, yeah. Plus, you have the tourism people that you're working with, so that that could be a benefit there for them as well. Sure, exactly, exactly. And I, I I've got all that in my sights now. I mean, I'm I want the rest of my life to be a, a fun adventure uh, as opposed to the grind that so much of it uh, was in the past. Although I have to, I should, I shouldn't, I don't want to make it sound that way. I had a lot of fun doing my business. I was, I designed home theaters and sound systems for 27 years. And I was, I got tired of it because I was, had had enough of crawling around in attics and underneath houses and drilling up inside joists to get wires up inside walls for volume controls and all this kind of stuff, the speakers. But I was really good at it. And 
it was very challenging and it was very fulfilling for a number of years. I just needed to finally back out of it when my elbows and knees started complaining, you know, but I moved enough for those heavy TVs before we had those light flat screens. They were super heavy, uh, big tubes. And I carried enough of those around now that my, uh, my lower back uh, has paid the price for that. Well, I mean, it, well, at least you had a good clientele from like the Johnny Depp's to Sharon Stone, Nicolas Cage, Robert Downey Jr., Ben Stiller, and others. How did you end up being, you know, the the person that handles their sound systems? Right. Um, I think initially it was luck. Um, I made friends with or, or business associates with people who sold equipment. Uh, there was a place in L.A. Um, that uh, was a discount place, but it was known within the movie industry. And so everyone would buy their electronics there. And I decided to go in there one day with a little card when I, this was back in 1988. And this was just in the early, st early days of surround sound when you could buy a pioneer Dolby Pro Logic surround sound receiver and have movies in your house and stereo VCRs were just starting to come out. So I hooked a few up for friends and I realized there's a business here and so I walked in there, gave them my card and said, Hey, I, I, I hooked this stuff up. They go, oh, we really, we, we can give you a lot of business because we're tired of doing this after hours for our, for our customers. And if we can hand it off to you, we'll, we'll, our wives will be happy. Yes. So uh, <laughs> that's how it started. Now that place was frequented. I mean, I was in there shopping myself one day and Ringo Starr was in there. And, you know, so apparently a lot of celebrities came through there or their people bought stuff there for them. Anyway, uh, these guys selling the stuff. Passed out my card to Johnny Depp, to Nicolas Cage. And I think from there, it's just the word of mouth. I was also able to use that uh, when I moved uh, to Portland, Oregon in 1993. I walked into a place like that there and I said, hey, you know, these are my clients. You know, and they're like, wow, you must know what you're doing. And so they, they started funneling business to me. And I ended up having my first billionaire client, uh, which would be uh, the founder of Nike, um, Phil and Penny Knight. Uh, they were, they were my clients and I ended up doing three or four houses for them. Um, you know, and so uh, yeah, I was lucky. And like I said, in LA, before I moved to Portland, there is a, a thing about, you know, privacy with celebrities. So when they realized that I was somebody who had been on the inside on, on in front of the camera as they were, and I was doing this now, it kind of reassured them that I wasn't going to be rifling through their waste baskets to find a prescription or something to sell to the inquirer, you know? So, so they, they end up, you know, the word of mouth worked within that community as well. And that helped a lot too. So I think that's kind of how it happened. You know, the secret to that kind of success is be respectful of your clients, respond to their, to their needs and respect their privacy. You know, that's bottom line, do a good job, do it when you tell them you're going to do it and uh, don't be greedy. You know, now are you, are do you do public appearances? Do you do events that people are, you know, in, incorporating maybe an actor or somebody that, you, you know, of your character into specialty events that are taking place somewhere? Do you have you done any stuff like that? Only well, so far, it's only been Little House on the Prairie reunions, which have been a lot of fun. Uh, and I, you know, it's been amazing to stand in front of four generations of women all wearing, you know, bonnets, you know, uh, you got the little four year old and then the, her mom and her mom and her mom. And they're all standing there going, we love little house. I'm like, wow, that's amazing. Uh, Michael Landon did an incredible job creating uh, an incredible legacy with this very, really well-crafted family show. Um, so I've done those. I think I did a chiller show one time in New Jersey, uh, six years ago. And I did a Hollywood show once. So I really haven't done a lot of these, but I mean, I'd like to do comic con someday, but I need someone who can, I can't push myself out there. I've got to have somebody just to say, hey, don't you want Grasshopper, the, the, the character who originated the Obi-Wan, Kenobi, Luke Skywalker, Mr. Miyagi, Karate Kid paradigm? That was that was Kung Fu. That was Grasshopper and Master Po. That's where it started. That's the DNA lineage, you know. So once people realize that and before I get too old, I would certainly like to make some, some more appearances. But, you know, I, I, I'm not a good self-promoter, so... What about corporate events? Have you done corporate events? Are you considering the option of working with? I have no idea how I, I would consider any option to, you know, speak if I could, but I would have to have someone help me with that. I, I can't do it myself. Interesting. 
you know, one of the, do you may, I mean, you obviously stay in touch with some of the people from the shows that you've done. Uh, maybe there's some kind of an organization that helps people do corporate and, you know, outside of once they're no longer. There isn't. Cause there isn't. Sorry. <laughs> there isn't. Oh, that's, hey, for those that are out there, maybe there's an opportunity right here for hey. you. You know, yes, there are, there are lots of actors and actresses and people who've done this kind of work that when they're in between jobs, it just isn't, you know, the, you know, the other, the ongoing things that make actors and actresses money that could be useful in the business. Well, this is what a publicist and an agent is for. Yeah. I mean, PR, uh, publicist agents, and there's also a publicity, uh, well, that's PR. No, public relations. That's public relations. That's publicity. You know, there are people who, you know, uh, do promote other people. Um, and that's really, I think, where it happens on that level. But again, you know, I could be more ambitious about it. Do I think sometimes that some of my experience is being squandered by not being shared? Sure. Why not? It's part of my belief in myself that I think I could. Well, that's why I'm here on this platform, you know. Uh, I'm trying to, I'm trying to do that, but no one, no one has asked me to do a corporate event. It'd be interesting. I would certainly be open to it, but again, how do you I have no idea how to find that? So we will, we will talk again. No. <laughs> okay. All right. But, um, is there anything else? You know, we're pretty much, I'm pretty much done with so much stuff and I don't know how we got through all these, um, items really quick, but, um, is there anything that you really want to tell the viewers, people who want to consider the option of spending some time with you face to face directly through your coaching program? What would well, be yeah. the message for them? Well, thanks. Uh, you know, I did write something down in answer to those questions here, so I'm just going to try to read it if I can. Um, let's see. Uh, well, um, I, well, you asked me uh, what are some wishes that you have and you would like to have, and my answer to that was. Um, I wish more people were willing to and able to set aside their knee-jerk judgments and look at situations and each other with fresh eyes to help them realize that we all have far more in common than the things we than than we than we don't have uh, things we allow to separate us. I, I had hoped I had hoped that the COVID uh, would have helped drive home this message, but it doesn't seem as though that has necessarily been the case. Um, but I think we talked about this earlier with it when we talked about the technology. So yeah, that kind of covered that in a way. Um, and then also the, your last question is what are some life advice that you can give us? And I, my answer to that was, um, uh, be patient, uh, and, um, and forgiving starting with yourself. Uh, Jesus taught, uh, that, but the forgiveness was attributed to him or his father. Um, it starts and ends with us. I'm afraid uh, when people, uh, of, of a certain faith, uh, really allow God to forgive them. I believe it is actually ourselves who's doing that. Be your own guru, I say. Uh, the eternal now is the only time we have for the present is in fact a present and it only, it's only we who, who can let ourselves open that present. You know, uh, you mentioned the word patience and people misunderstand the word patience. Patience hmm. is not waiting. Patience is doing lots of work in preparedness, in being prepared for what you're trying to accomplish. People think, oh, just be patient, you will get that job. Or be patient and you will get whatever, and you will do whatever. The patience part is lots of work takes place while you're being patient to get yourself prepared so that they comes because of you done all the work, not because right. you sat there waiting for patience. So, you know, <laughs> I, I, True. I, I, I've always tried clarifying that with people who, who miss, you know, who say the word, but people interpret it as waiting rather than working double time. Well, okay. I will qualify. I, I hear what you're saying. That's, there's definitely great value in, in, in what you just said. But also patience is itself an act, you know, it is actually, it is actually a, it is, a, it is something that you are doing, you know, yes. you are being patient. You're not, like you said, it's not just sitting around waiting. That's called being lazy. Yeah, that's not <laughs> <But> patience. Being, <laughs> you know, patience is a, is, is an act of waiting 
And as you said, a form of preparation. Yeah, absolutely. That's well put. I like the way you put that, actually. Yeah, cause but I agree not, with you. Yeah, because you're trying to do all this stuff, right? You want to write your autobiography. You're not being patient and just sitting there. You're actually writing it. You're preparing exactly. it. You're, you, you've got pages. You put pen to paper or, you know, fingers to a keyboard. Right. And, and you're preparing to when you get to that point where that autobiography is done and right. that screenwriter or director, whomever wants to turn it into that something that you want it to, you're prepared when you hand it over. Right. But if That's you right. found that person and you didn't have pen to paper yet, be like, yeah, call me when you got something done, which is will be never. <laughs> Right, exactly, exactly. That's true. Um, I have to wrap this up, so I'm going to give you the two-minute warning that you asked me to give you. Oh, okay, excellent. So that is awesome. I want to thank you very much, uh, Rodamus. Um, Rodamus. Pronounce it again. Rodamus. Rodamus. Hippopotamus. Rodamus. I apologize for that. And it's okay. Out of, you know, France, coming out of France, east of Paris somewhere, and... Will you be in the States for any time soon? As soon as the vaccine happens. That's coming very soon. So, you know, I, just the other day they were talking about it's, uh, the, the, the effectancy of the vaccine is over 90%. And it's now try, starting to trickle out that these things are, are coming out, fortunately. And for those... And Pfizer. Pfizer is working with a, with a, Pfizer is a U.S. company working with a German company. It's a, it's a German American co-production. This, this particular one you're, you're referring to that has a 90%. Exactly. Yeah. And, and it's, and it's, it's all going to be a worldwide production because everyone has to, you know, it's got, it has, everyone has to get it. Everyone has to be processed and hopefully, you know, the spread slows down to the point where it disappears. So everyone stay safe out there. Hopefully we'll get to see you soon. Do you, do you come to the States for anything, any reason on a regular basis or just you, you, you've been in Paris for a while and you're staying there? Well, no, I, I've been, I was a year and a half ago in July. I was there, uh, again, because of a little house in the prairie event that was taking place, uh, in another state. But I, I came to see friends in California and then I got on a plane and we went to, uh, Minnesota, uh, to Walnut Grove, actually Walnut Grove, Minnesota for the 45th uh, anniversary of Little House. And I was there with my, fellow cast members who are still alive. Um, and uh, that was a lot of fun. I need to, it's been, you know, it's been a year and a half, so I'm hankering to, to, to come back and visit. And so as soon as I'm able to do that, I will. I mean, of course, as an American citizen, I could probably go back there anytime, but it's coming back the other way that I'd have trouble coming back to France. So I don't want to put myself in that situation. So. Do, you, do you have a website or a fan page or a Facebook page or anything like that? Yeah, I have, I have, a, yeah, I have a Facebook page. Uh, there's a couple of different ones. One is... Uh, Little House in the Prairie, Rodimus Para as John Jr. That's a rather long name, but that's how you find Little House in the Prairie, Rodimus Para as John Jr. And then uh, there's also um, uh, Rodimus Para, Grasshopper and more. That's another page. And then, of course, just my Facebook page, Rodimus Para, and you can find me there. I'm wearing a, a blue uh, a blue polo shirt, a blue uh, you know tennis shirt. That's that's where people can request uh, to friend me, and I I will I will friend them. But for those that really want to spend some real time with you and develop a, develop whatever they need, whether it's acting, whether it's advice, whether it's life coaching, um, they can log on to coachtheworld.com, we'll look you up. And I think it's Grasshopper, your channel. Is it Grasshopper? Um, I, I, one of them is. There's a couple of different ones I have. One of them is Grasshopper. The other one is, I think, Rodimus Pro. I think it's my name. R. Adam I E.S. Rodimus. I think it's Rodimus. Yeah. But the one we're connected with right now is the Grasshopper one. Okay, very good. Gotcha. Yeah. So, yeah. So, there's a couple of different capacities. Uh, like you said, I can help people uh, how to start a business, how to move a business. Uh, that's something that I have some good experience with. Uh, the acting thing, as you were talking about, how to get in into the movie business, uh, or just you know how to overcome some traumas and difficulties. Uh, I have. I'm not a. I don't have a degree, but sometimes people get honorary degrees in life because they. They did the work and they they got somewhere, um, and I think I'm one of those folks. Well, absolutely. I mean, you know, there's nothing better than actually doing the degree rather than talking about the piece of paper on the wall. That's a whole exactly. big difference. 
So I'm Anthony Kovic with LeaderCast, and I want to thank Radamus Para for taking the time out of his busy schedule to talk to us and give you an insight of his life, his activities, his actors, his actorship over the years. Do you know, do you remember how many roles you've had? It's on IMDb. I didn't, I don't, I didn't count okay. them. I mean, you know. <laughs> Thank you again, and I will see you on the next program. Thanks so much for the opportunity. I really enjoyed it. Great questions, and nice to meet you. You too. All right. Take care.